Welcome to Progress in San Diego. Uh, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm your host, Walter Davis. And as you know, we focus on human rights, social justice, and the environment on my television shows. I'm wondering if American people realize that when you get a cup of coffee or you get certain crops like t tomatoes, corn, and other things that are grown, that there is a terrible human toll being taken on uh, people around the world, a and also our families. We have major corporations that were involved in slavery, enslaving African people, enslaving, uh, enslaving people in Latin America. And some of these companies still exist today. We have the Firestone Corp uh, Corporation that is uh, taking rubber out of West Africa. And there are very atrocious policies where they are uh, dismembering people that don't produce enough rubber on those plantations. We have corporations like the Leslie Corporation, Sarah Lee, and Philip yeah. Morris. They're using pesticides in, in, in large quantities and poisoning uh, people in adjacent farms that are, that are next to areas that they are spraying pesticides. So the, the children are developing diseases. So with me this evening, um, I have David Smith of Fair Trade La Mesa, and he's going to be going into some of these issues and talk to me about fair trade, uh, among other issues. Welcome to the show. Thank you Thanks. very much. Uh, I think my personal interest in fair trade began years ago. Um, I used to translate for a lot of church groups that would go down to northern Mexico. They would go for these week-long trips, and uh, a few of these trips um, would end up going out to areas of northern Mexico not very far from the border at all, where the, a lot of the migrant farm workers were working. So we would go out, uh, these groups would go out, they would bring donations, and they would see just deplorable conditions. You would see children born with horrible def uh, deformities from uh, the pesticides their mothers were breathing in, children with malnutrition, children with um, blonde, discolored hair because of malnutrition, distended bellies, just unbelievable conditions, people living in little tarp huts, sleeping on the ground, sleeping on pieces of cardboard. And I noticed there were three main reactions from the people who took part in these trips. Either they would go back to their suburban lives and forget about it. You could call that a neutral reaction. Some folks got a charitable reaction. They said, I want to help these people. I want to give them something. Other folks got a negative reaction. And they would blame it on something supposedly inherent about Mexico or about the people or something cultural or whatever. And they would say, man, Mexico... Mexico needs to get its stuff together. There must be something wrong with Mexico that these conditions exist like this. But nobody looked into the bigger picture of why those conditions existed. Uh, I remember one of these trips that I was translating for, we were walking through one of the camps and just walking through incredibly devastating conditions. And I'm walking there with a young, suburban young man, high school student, and I'm chatting with him and he said, he said David, I, I want to do something to help these people. What do you think I could do to help them? And he's thinking in terms of charity. He's thinking, these people don't have, I do have, what could I give them? And I said, you know what, doctors, when they become doctors, there's a Hippocratic Oath that they take. One major part of that Hippocratic Oath is they say, before you try to heal anybody, don't do any harm. Don't hurt the person before you try to heal them. That's what we need to ask ourselves as consumers. Before we talk about charity, before we talk about helping somebody, we need to ask ourselves, are we part of the problem? Are we part of the problem? And as consumers, on many cases, we are part of the problem with what we are consuming, with what we're buying. If we are not taking the trouble to look into where those products come from, oftentimes with the products that we're buying to fuel our own consumer lifestyle, we are being a part of these conditions. Because in these fields that these groups would go to, the church groups would go down, they'd give out some food, they'd give out some donations, they'd feel good about themselves, they'd come back to their suburban lifestyles, and they come back to eat the very same tomatoes that those people they were visiting are picking every day. Because most of those fields, even though they're in Mexico, they are run by U.S. corporations. And at the end of the day, the fruits and vegetables those people are picking are being shipped up to the United States, and they are for American consumption. And they're for these giant transnational companies and to be fueling these giant supermarkets that we've got. And this is all happening in Mexico. So this is you know, not even touching immigration. And then, of course, because of these conditions, many people migrate. 
Many people leave their hometowns in southern Mexico. They leave rural towns and they go into the cities. Many people leave Mexico and come to the United States. And when they come here, again, you see three main reactions. Either people turn a blind eye to immigration. People have a negative reaction sometimes. And they talk about, they complain, say immigrants are bad for the U.S. They come up with all sorts of anti-immigrant, xenophobic arguments against immigration. And oftentimes the people who, like myself, believe in immigrants' rights stand up and they talk about immigrants' rights but never talk about why people migrate. They talk about, oh, we should enforce the law less. We should enforce the immigration laws less or we should change immigration laws. But you don't hear people out there talking about why people migrate and talking about the hand that our corporations and that our government and the policies that our corporations, our companies, and our government has mm -hmm. in the reason why people migrate to begin with. So th there are many reasons why the people are migrating. Now, although these American corporations are operating in these areas, the people are not really realizing any wealth or very much wealth from the, the development of these agricultural conglomerates there in their area. In fact, it's quite damaging because the the mass production of coffee, for example, on these large plantations has resulted in the uh, devaluing of coffee in Mexico, which in turn has put a lot of the farmers out of business in Mexico. And they in turn had to migrate uh, to the United States in terms of looking for economic opportunity. Is that correct? Absolutely. The border is not a border for a lot of things. The border does not exist for a lot of things. The border is a semi-porous membrane. And so through that border, wealth and money can pass northward. And so this happens whether you're talking about the migrant agricultural workers uh, near Ensenada, whether you're talking about the maquiladora workers in Tijuana or in other cities along the border, whether you're talking about coffee farmers in Chiapas. All these people are working in Mexico. These people were born in Mexico. They're working in Mexico. But the wealth that they're producing at the end of the day is going northward into the coffers of these corporations. Coffee is a great illustration of that. Um, if you look at coffee, at the coffee trade, uh, a laborer who works on a coffee plantation anywhere in the world, the average wage that person gets is between $1 and $3 a day. Meanwhile, the head of the Philip Morris Corporation makes more than $5 million a year. And so you're talking about a transfer of wealth out of those places, out of those communities. Wealth is transferred up here. And when you see people migrating, they're just following the flow of dollars. They're following the flow of money that's flowing northward out of their own communities and out of their country. And uh, coffee is the best illustration of that because coffee is one product that's almost exclusively produced in the developing world. Uh, Hawaii, I believe, is the only example of a part of the first world that is producing coffee. Other than that, coffee is a, a product that uh, is one of the most unequal products that you can find as far as who's doing the hard work how much money they're making, who's sitting up in an air-conditioned office somewhere in New York, how much money that guy's making. It's an incredible differentiation between, between those two figures. It's, it's staggering. And so those people head northward because they can't make a living, they can't survive. I've visited towns, I've visited uh, communities in southern Mexico in the state of Oaxaca that are coffee-producing towns, or used to be coffee-producing towns anyway. And I've been out there, I've been to one town in Oaxaca, it's a ghost town. You go out there, there's hardly anybody left. An entire generation of young people has left that town. Between uh, People between about 12, 13, and 60 are just absent from this town because you can't make a living farming coffee in that town anymore. And it didn't used to be that way. Um, a lot of policies during the Reagan-Thatcher years in the 1980s, neoliberal economics, took away a lot of controls of prices that these people depended on to make sure that they would have enough to survive by farming coffee. Uh, there was an institution called the Instituto Mexicano del Café, called INME Café, the Mexican Institute of Coffee. And uh, they would set a price control. They would give, pay you a stable price. They would give you credits for your coffee farming. And so nobody got rich farming coffee. Um, but as long as that institution used to exist, people knew that they could make X amount of money and that they could survive making coffee. Um, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, as a predecessor to NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, Ine Cafe was vanished. It was taken out, taken out. So after that, coffee farming became a gamble. You never knew how much money you were going to make. One year it might be up here. The next year it might be down here. It was a total gamble. And a lot of years you would actually lose money. All the money that you would invest in producing that one harvest of coffee per year, you would come out 
losing on the other end. So people realized, I, I can't live. I just can't survive. And so they leave and they go somewhere else. And now this town, it's, it's lost its, its lifeblood. It used to be this vibrant community. It used to be this, this town where people helped each other out, lived together. Now everybody's left for the main city or they left for northern Mexico uh, or they've left for the United States. And these young people come back. They come back angry and resentful because they don't feel like they have a place anywhere. They migrate to Mexico City or to northern Mexico or to the United States and they don't feel like they fit in. They go back to their hometown and they resent their hometown. They resent the poverty that they associate that with. So you see a lot of young people on the holidays when young people come back to town. You see people angry. You see people dressed like thugs, dressed like gangsters. People get into gunfights with each other, something that never used to happen in this town. And this is a direct result of the economic policies that folks up here are setting. People sitting in their air-conditioned office are setting these economic policies that have a very human effect on these people in these towns. And so we can choose to be a part of that or we can choose to be a part of the solution. So I don't think that most American people are aware of, of these phenomena. And, and so this is happening in Africa. This is happening, as you mentioned, in developing parts of the world. Uh, Latin America, people are being victimized. There's war. There's thug harassment going on. There are gangs. And, 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 and one of the most devastating parts of this, as you mentioned, they're, they're spraying the pesticides, right? And the kids that are living adjacent to these farms are getting the pesticides into their system and having all kind of birth defects. But then the American consumer is consuming those tomatoes with the pesticides that have seeped into it through the skin which is now causing an epidemic of various diseases in this country like cancer. So we're all being victimized by this. The prices, Starbucks, mm -hmm. very expensive cups of coffee. Yet the people that are doing the hard work to produce that coffee aren't benefiting in terms of a financial reward. So that's not very fair. That's not a very good situation. So. I, I saw that some of these large companies we, we've been talking about, Nestle, Sara Lee, Philip Morris, are some of the largest contributors to campaigns. They're, they're very active in terms of making sure that policies are put into place that promote their profits. And some of the profits are just obscene, are they not? In terms of uh, profits for Philip Morris, I, I have data here you know, showing that they're making billions upon billions of dollars on the backs of these poor people and then yet promoting products like tobacco and and uh, poison tainted vegetables that are killing the American people mm -hmm. yeah and I the story I told about that one town in Mexico I wish it was just one anecdotal story about one town in Mexico but you multiply that story literally by a million you multiply that story by every other rural town in Mexico every other rural town in Latin America multiplied by rural communities in Africa, in Southeast Asia, all over the world. And these fat cats who are, who are getting away with it, essentially, um, as you mentioned, the, the lobbies that they have are incredible. If you compare your vote and my vote, the vote, whoever we vote for, for president, compare that one vote with the amount of money that one of these companies is giving to candidates from both parties, it's, there's no comparison. So that's the bad news. The good news is there's a different way that we can vote. We can vote with our pocketbooks. We can vote with our consumer choices. Mm -hmm. And I'm not telling anybody to not buy. You have to buy stuff. You have to buy food. You have to buy clothing. Um, I love drinking coffee. I'm a big coffee drinker. But it's about choosing what you're going to buy. And that's where the fair trade movement comes in. The good news is that you don't have to just feel bad about where things come from or feel bad about the devastation and poverty in this world that we indirectly are a part of through our consumer choices. We can choose to stop contributing to suffering and start contributing to people's livelihoods instead. And that happens through the fair trade movement. Uh, the fair trade movement started a while ago and uh, it is a movement of, of various different organizations, churches, uh, groups all over the world that are seeking an alternative form of uh, commerce, an alternative way to do trade that's more transparent, that's more open, that's more just, that's more equitable, and uh, again, coffee is a great illustration for how fair trade works. Mm -hmm. In the traditional 
coffee trade, you have either a large plantation or a bunch of small farmers. Um, oftentimes you've got this huge plantation where people are working as virtual or sometimes literal slaves on this plantation. Mm -hmm. uh, then that coffee goes through dozens of different middlemen to get to the international coffee market. It eventually comes to a coffee importer. That importer then sends it to a roaster. Roaster roasts it. Coffee mm -hmm. ends up in our cup at Starbucks. But that's the coffee that's got sweat and blood in it, is the coffee that we're drinking at Starbucks, unless it's fair trade certified. When coffee's fair trade certified, it is produced by a worker-owned co-op. That co-op has access to all the same information that all the importers, that all the roasters, that all the shops have. You can look at a bag of fair trade coffee. You find a serial number on there. You can find exactly what community that coffee was brought from, who produced it, who picked it, who was paid how much for that coffee. All that information is made available to everybody. Uh, those farmers are paid a fair, sustainable living wage for their work. And in addition, a little bit of extra money goes into what's called the fair trade bonus for that community. And it goes into a fund to support that community developing itself. And so when that community becomes part of a fair trade worker-owned co-op of coffee producers, then that community receives funds that are reinvested into that community. Um, and I've talked to, to folks who are from fair trade producing co-ops and fair trade producing communities. And it's night and day difference. You go from talking about these children born with de birth defects and uh, these incredible devastating conditions to talking about a community where people have this very stable lifestyle. They have kids are going to school. Uh, people are, are reinvesting in the community. They've got health clinics. They've got hospitals. They've got roads. And it's, it's not a bad place to live. And you've got people who don't have to leave their town anymore. All of a sudden, it's enough. All of a sudden, being a coffee farmer is enough to take care of your family. It's enough to survive. It's enough to have a nice standard of living for yourself. And isn't that what every single one of us wants? That's what any of us want for our children, for our grandchildren. And why would we expect any other human being in any other part of the world to want something less for their people? And so the way that you support that is looking for the fair trade label. The label, this is not a, a brand, it's not one company, it's a label that shows that an international uh, body of supervisors have certified that producer as a fair trade producer. And they've certified that the, the product was produced ecologically in an ecologically sound way. They've certified that no child labor, no slavery was involved in the production of that. They've certified that all these standards are being met of a, of a fair wage, of an equitable wage for the people producing it that it was bought from a fair trade co-op, which is a business owned by the workers themselves. They own the business. They run it. They're not working for some big plantation master. And so when you see that little fair trade label, that little person in black and white with the arrows coming out of it, you see that label and you know that you are supporting a different kind of world, a different kind of economy. And so the choice is up to each of us to go out there and look for that label or not. Well, that's just a, a really outstanding concept you know, to look for the label and, and the way that that tracks everything goes down to how much the farmer got paid. And so it really holds people accountable. Now, obviously this, this label is on a very small percentage, correct? Um, I just looked at some stats here about uh, large corporations turning billions of dollars in profits in, in just a single quarter. Mm -hmm. So there's robbery occurring, there's greed occurring, there's slavery uh, occurring in terms of how people are being paid. And I'm just wondering, when are the American people just going to get mad and say that enough is enough? When, when are we going to start boycotting and fighting back with our wallets? How are we going to continue to have corporations go over and destroy entire communities, destroy their economic well-being, and then send our children over to fight in battles and to die for, for needless wars. And so the impoverished people and the middle classes are being destroyed on a global level. The higher prices that we are paying on the backs of these impoverished people in various parts of the world, if we stand by and let that continue to happen, then we also have detrimental economic results as well as ethical and moral uh, failures uh, that are compounding in, in this entire equation. So. We're down to our last 10 minutes now, believe it or not. This went by really, really quickly. I want to make sure that we um, get out your message. What else do you want to convey uh, to the American people today? First off, I want to see people have a change of heart. I want to see people realize the humanity 
of every person who's picking their coffee, every person who's picking their vegetables, who is sewing their clothing, putting their tennis shoes together. I compare it to the, the cartoon Monsters, Inc. and the plot of that cartoon. In that, that, it looks like a kid's movie. It's a happy little cartoon. But the story is these two monsters live in a city where their entire world is powered by kids suffering. Kid, they go and scream. They make the kids scream. They frighten children. And the screams of those kids power their city until they meet one of those kids. And that kid becomes human to them. And they realize we cannot keep on powering our city by the suffering of kids. And they make the switch. Every individual person has to make that switch. But I think it's about going far beyond your own individual choices as a consumer. Uh, and that's where the campaign that Fairtrade La Mesa is a part of comes into play. Uh, Fairtrade La Mesa is pushing for La Mesa to become what's called a fair trade town. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean that every product is going to be fair trade certified in La Mesa. It means a certain percentage of products will be offered in a certain number of stores in La Mesa. Um, so the important part comes in where every consumer in La Mesa has to go looking for those products and has to say, I want fair trade, not only as individuals, but as communities. If you are a part of any group, if you're a part of any church, if you're a part of a school, if you're a part of a hospital you work at, make the switch. Ask your hospital to switch over from regular uniforms, unfair uniforms, exploitation uniforms, to fairly traded and fairly bought uniforms. If your church, church buys coffee, switch over from the coffee you're buying to fair trade certified coffee. Make the switch as a group, make the switch as communities. And only as we create this slow rising tide of Americans who say, we are fed up of being part of the problem. We are tired of being like those monsters that are fueling our society by the suffering of others. We cannot keep living like that. We can't keep being a part of the problem. But you become a part of the solution by supporting fair trade. You become a part of the solution by eventually pushing for a rising tide of people buying fair trade to the point that fair trade becomes the norm and not the exception. Right now, unfortunately, it's the exception. Unfortunately, you have to go looking for that little label and you have to go hunt it out. Sometimes it's, it's nearly impossible to try to find some products that are fairly traded. Why is that? Why should we be okay with that? We should not be okay with that being a little niche market that's about a, a voluntary choice to go looking for it. I want to see unfair exploitation trade go the same route that slavery and everything else we decided to throw out the window goes. I want to see all that exploitation go down into the history books. I want to see us saying, we don't want any coffee with blood in it. We don't want any coffee with sweat in it. We want fairly traded coffee. We want to give people a fair chance at life. That's all we're about. Well, that's certainly a wonderful concept. Now, you're talking about fair trade La Mesa. Is there a fair trade San Diego or fair trade San Marcos? There is. You can, you can Google a group called Fair Trade San Diego. Uh, there are quite a few groups in San Diego that are working on fair trade, actually. Um, I suggest that everybody do a little research online, go looking out for fair trade, um, and again, look for those labels to look for. And uh, the, the campaign to make La Mesa declared a fair trade town, we're shooting for next year. After that, uh, there is talk of a similar campaign being undertaken in San Diego. So uh, we're going to be talking to the media. We're going to be keeping people up to date and uh, keeping everybody up to speed on, on where that is. But hopefully there will be a campaign in San Diego at large to make fair San Diego declared a fair trade town. But again, the power from that comes from individual consumers and groups of consumers and communities choosing to switch over to fair trade products. Right now, the coffee that Americans drink, I think about 5% is fair trade certified. In England, 80% of their coffee is fair trade certified. In Denmark, 100% of their coffee is fair trade because eventually enough people pressured their government to tell them, we don't want unfair coffee. So this is not a pipe dream. It's not uh, a utopian ideal. It's something that can be done and has be done, been done in other countries. Well, that's great. And we plan to have a link um, to uh, fair trade La Mesa and to your assorted uh, blogs and other websites uh, on the Community Coalition website so that people can get more information and please look for the telephone number and website that will appear at the end uh, of this broadcast to get additional information on how you can be a part of the fair trade uh, movement. It is integral that we all become uh, involved with this issue. Uh, it is a fueling uh, fire it's a fire that's being fueled, rather, by uh, slavery, by unfair trade practices, by, by people being taken advantage of. 
Uh, and this is not freedom. Okay, this is, this is not the way that I want to be represented as an American citizen, uh, to have large American corporations go abroad and take advantage of people uh, in this way. Uh, anything else you want to share, sir? We, we, we're down to our last two minutes. Um, I invite people to, to pick one product. If I'm sure that there are a few people out there who will maybe, maybe not go looking for the fair trade label. But I know that there's somebody else who's going to see this and want to do something a little bit more. So I invite you and your community that you are a part of, whether that's an organization, whether it's a, a church, uh, a synagogue, a mosque, whatever organization or group of other people you are a part of, get together and decide one product that all of you consume, all of you buy, and figure out how to get a fair trade version of that and make the switch. Whether that's your college, whether that's your school, the school that your children go to. If your children go to a school that buys uniforms, get together, get a group of people together, educate yourselves about where those uniforms come from, and ask the school to make the switch. Ask them to buy only fair traded uniforms. And that's the way we're going to beat this thing, is by coming together and working as a rising tide of consumers who say enough is enough. We cannot keep contributing to this suffering. Okay, and with that, we, we again are going to have to have uh, another part to this show, uh, obviously because we have just run out of time. Uh, please join us again next Sunday at 5 p.m. on COPS Communications for Progress in San Diego and stand by for Lee Smith Cooper's show, Community Issues, a Tapestry of Concerns that comes on every Sunday at 6 p.m. And be sure to watch Laura Thompson's Community Artist Connection that comes on every Thursday night at 9.30. And soon we're going to have uh, Consider the Possibilities with Coach Marilyn coming on. We have a very exciting lineup. We're going to continue to focus on the issues that deal with human rights, social justice, and the environment. I highly encourage you to come to the Community Coalition and see the links that we're going to have provided for fair trade and, and learn more. Learn about what's happening with Nestle and the other corporations uh, that are doing hideous things to, uh, to other countries and people. Uh, I thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, this is Walter Davis. Come back and see us.
Could love drive you to fly? Could hope be the only way? And would it be a crazy question? Would you take it all and throw it all away? Take me down to the final decision And the world will break apart today Take me down to the final decision And the world will break apart today Break apart 